Hi everyone, Chris here back looking at, yes, another AMD laptop, but this time around I've got one that actually has a dedicated GPU. So I reviewed the Mech Revo Code 01, which is basically the same machine as the Schenker Via 15 Pro with its Ryzen 7 4800H. Impressive performance. But for me, it was just lacking one area. And a lot of people did comment and said, hey, it's nice having the Vega graphics with its seven cores, but what about the dedicated GPU? And it turned out that when I was using Adobe Premiere Pro for my video editing for my YouTube videos, it was just too lagful, laggy and painful when I do my huge, massive, like 20 minute long reviews. It became just so frustrating, I could not do it. That's where I needed a dedicated GPU. So I ended up selling that machine, and I've got this. Long story short, I bought the XMG. I was looking at all sorts of AMD laptops, but I decided I would get this model for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, not a lot of people are reviewing this particular brand. And number two, this has a power boost to it. So overboost mode, we can increase the power limit on the Ryzen 7 4800H right up to 72 watts. Remember, the stock limit level is actually 45 watts, so we're getting quite a boost here, and you'll see it does come through in the performance. And then the RTX 2060 refresh. Not a lot of manufacturers have the refresh model, and this one has the DDR6 RAM in there, lower voltage RAM, and it also does have a power limit in this model here, up to 110 watts on the GPU. And as you see later on, that means the GPU can actually stretch its legs a little, allowing the core clock on the GPU just to boost up quite a bit higher than say running at 90 watts. And it does make a bit of a difference, two old frames per second. So what else does this model have that makes it interesting? Well, it's got a 144 hertz refresh rate screen. It's not a bad screen at all. It's got 270 nits. That's what I've measured here. And it also has an Adobe RGB of 75% there as well. So overall, good color coverage gamut with this one. And it's got the slim bezels, top, left, and right, and yes, a chunky big bezel on the bottom, with a webcam in an absolute terrible location. So unfortunately, yes, the webcam is down in the chin, looking right up our chin, and here's a sample of it. So here is our webcam, and it's in a very unflattering location, just kind of looking up your nose, your neck, and everything. And when you're typing on the keyboard, your hands are right there. So it's a shame they weren't able to put this particular webcam into the top bezel. The microphone quality as well, that, well, is okay. It doesn't seem to be too bad, but yes, if you do type on the keyboard, you're going to be hearing a little bit of that noise coming through there. So overall, a uh, poor quality webcam in this particular laptop. And then the keyboard on this one. This keyboard to me seems like it's almost made by the so same ODM that makes the Steel Series keyboards that I've used before in MSI's laptops because it has that same kind of feel to it. Good feedback, it's not a noisy loud keyboard. Uh, flex right in the middle is not really an issue or a problem. And travel is good too, it's about 1.5 millimeters or so. And it's backlit of course, RGB. It wouldn't be a gaming laptop if we didn't have, of course, have RGB. Now the palm rest, this is made out of an alloy. And look at it, I've intentionally not cleaned it for the last hour or so. You probably think, Chris, what do you mean? It looks like you haven't cleaned it for months or weeks. No, this thing is a shocker. I mean, really bad. I only had this a few hours and it already looked like it was months old. It's that bad, you gotta keep cleaning it constantly all the time. Uh, the lid is the same too as well. The lid is made out of alloy. It has the, um, the XMG logo, sorry, on the top there. And yeah, a big absolute magnet for me just picking up all your smudges everywhere. So it always looks messy. It's just the way it is. And then a touchpad. So this particular touchpad here is made out of plastic, supports Windows 10 gestures. And I like it. It actually does work really well, and especially for a gaming laptop. The mouse buttons left and right, the hardware they're in there, you don't have to press down too deep. So on the right hand side, we've got two USB 2 ports and an SD card slot. There's an exit vent there as well, you can see. And then we have here on the left, two audio in and out. Well, two audio jacks, one is in, one is out. USB 2, and then the, another exit vent there, and gigabit LAN 2 as well. Then on the back, we've got two mini display ports here. So both of these do support 4K 60, and they do actually correct directly up to that RTX 2060 and support G-Sync, HDMI 2, 
and our Type-C port. Now, this Type-C port is just USB 3.2 data only, so no video out of this, and it does not support power delivery. Because I bought the RTX 2060 version here with the 110 watt power limit that it's got with it, it does include 180 watt power supply here. If you get the 1650 Ti, then that one is 120 watts, I believe, their power supply included. Now, they do include XMG, the stickers here, so you don't have them pre-applied, the Ryzen 7 stickers, which is great. I wish all manufacturers would do this. Let us decide. And there is a pen drive here that does contain our drivers. The Core 15 weighs just under 2 kilos, which is a very good weight considering the power it has. With the power brick and the cable, that brings our total travel weight then to just over 2.5 kilos. Again, this is a very good weight. So one of the reasons I went for this particular laptop is I saw that there were no real restrictions with the cooling, unlike, say, some of the laptops from ASUS that I've seen reviews of. All of the vents here on the bottom, all open, so there's a lot of airflow around the components. It can suck in fresh air. So we've got two solid rubber feet here on the bottom, two at the front, two downwards firing speakers. There will be a sample in this review of just how they sound. But let's have a look now at the internals. So you remove all of the screws around the outside and you can pry off this rear lid. It's very easy to do so and good for maintenance later on if you need to clean out dust. So two downwards firing speakers here. We have the 62 watt hour battery. This is our wireless card, it's the Intel AX200. The two sodium RAM slots that do support up to 64 gigabytes, 3.2 gigahertz RAM is the max spec there, but you can configure from their website different options for your SSD, your RAM, and even the wireless card. So I decided to supply and use my own SSD. There's no point in me configuring one of them when I bought it, because I've already got a lot of SSDs around, so I already have that installed, but that is one of two NVMe bays here. So you can install a second NVMe drive. So we've got two coolers, and the four copper transfer thermal pipes there as well. And I will be in this review, of course, focusing on the thermals. I'll give you an update on the fan noise and better life you can expect out of this particular 62 watt hour battery. So the BIOS options we get here with the Core 15 AMD version is, well, quite a few advanced settings. You can disable the webcam via the BIOS. There's some settings there for setting up our RAID on those two NVMe drives. But what is missing, which I would like to see in here, is RAM configuration options. So if you install RAM that does support 3.2 gigahertz, you can actually set it to that and not have it running at, for example, 2.6. Now, before I get onto all the benchmarks and that more interesting stuff, I will just get this out of the way, which is the control center. So we've got options here for the keyboard lights when it times out, which is good to have this. Some manufacturers most of them actually that I review normally don't offer this. It's just a standard timeout and that's it. You cannot change it. Display settings, other options there, for example, disabling, disabling that Windows keys. Very handy. That used to kill me a lot when I was playing hardcore Diablo. In fact, I ended up removing the key from my keyboard, uh, Diablo 2, back in the day, a long time ago. Backlight settings, of course, for our keyboard, so you can adjust here all your different lighting options, pretty self-explanatory. Status, just letting you know the status of the system. In general, you can view the performance, the load right there, information about our CPU, the RAM installed, and of course this here too about the GPU. But the really interesting stuff is our performance mode options that they have given us here. So this is where we can get that extra power limit and probably one of the reasons you would get this laptop just to get that extra performance that are the manufacturers aren't actually offering because their cooling is probably not up to it. So CPU power boost, if this is enabled, this little checkbox, that lets this processor use up to 72 watts, which is a lot. That's well over the 45 watt stock power limit. There's also a little box here to enable 100% fan. Turning that on, it, it is quite loud. It gets up to about 54 decibels, but more on the fan noise later under the different performance modes. The enthusiast mode that lets us use 54 watts and I think a lot of people for gaming might actually prefer this because the CPU won't heat up as much and it gives the GPU uh, just really enough room to really get up to that 110 watt power limit that the RTX 2060 has. 
the refresh on this particular model right here. And then we've got the standard performance mode. So the options for the fan here, we have silent, balanced, and fast. This is self-explanatory and you've got custom as well. So if you want to find that balance between just the temperature and fan noise that you're happy with, that's where you do it. You tweak there and it will take a while of course to find the perfect setting for yourself. Now if you tick the eco box here, this is how we can ensure really that the fan's not going to get loud. You can keep it on the eco box and the silent profile, but what eco does is limit our power limit then to just 25 watts. So it still performs quick. It's got the eight cores, 16 threads, and it's as fast as say one of those ultra low voltage machines then. Um, but it's a good option that they've given us all of this. So that's the control center right there. Plenty of options. Good that we have this. But the main thing is, of course, that over boost mode, just getting that maximum performance, the 72 watts out of this Ryzen 7 4800H. So if you take a look at GPU-Z, the device ID, we can confirm that it is the new refresh of the RTX 2060 refresh. This year it was released with that lower power RAM on it. And in this particular model, the power limit is right up to 110 watts. So performance wise, it should be able to hold those boosts and the higher clocks on the GPU, just giving us an advantage over the previous earlier models, especially the ones at 90 watts. And okay, the Ryzen 7, the 4800H, eight cores, six threads, it's seven nanometer, very potent mobile chip, very, very good. So what about our RAM? Now I was a little concerned about this. The RAM that I put in was two 16 gigabyte sticks, DDR4, 3.2 gigahertz. It's the HyperX RAM that I went with. And I didn't think it was actually going to work here with the XMP profiles, but I can confirm here that it did work, it selects it, and you've got a CAS latency here of CL20, which is a little bit better than say the Samsung RAM that people often use with this particular one here. Now I did try some Crucial RAM, it didn't work, okay, even though it was supposed to support the 3.2 gigahertz, it only ran at 2.6, so bear that in mind, what kind of RAM you're going to use in here, I would suggest going for the Samsung or the HyperX, uh, which I have in here. So we do have the swappable graphics, switchable graphics, and through the control panel here, you can select what you want to use. So by default, it's auto select, and you can force it just like the Intel laptops to either be the high performance or integrated graphics, depending on what you want there. So if you are on the battery, you're not doing anything demanding, it will automatically be then on the Vega graphics with its seven cores, but I will be forcing it onto just high performance for all of my tests. I've actually already done this. It's just to ensure that it's going to be running on that RTX 2060 refresh. Moving on to now some benchmarks here. These are all synthetic benchmarks that were run with the system being cool in the overboost mode and it's with the 100% fan. I have not used a cooler or anything like that. No laptop coolers. I never use them. I don't believe in them. I don't like adding extra clutter to my desk. So Cinebench R15, I've actually just run this one. There was nothing else at the time when I did it open in the background, that is. And it has a very good score here. So the CPU score is multi-core, almost 2000 CB. That is absolutely crazy for such a thin and well, under two kilo laptop here, we're talking about excellent, excellent score. So if you keep running it, it will drop down a little bit to about 1900 there in points, but that is still really something. Cinebench R20, super score here. Now maybe not the fastest actually, but it is still really good. I mean, come on, 4,555 points, multi-core score here. Wow, top, top, top score. There are probably other models out there, maybe the 17, inch model could actually do a little bit better because it's got slightly beefier cooling I believe in that one but still that is just a great and excellent result here so let's have a look now at just a few other benchmarks so superposition ran this as well just the complete stock preset when you first load it up and that is a decent score not bad of course this is the GPU here performance we are talking about and just hit pause if you want to see these in a little bit more detail I don't tend to take too long on this because I find it a little bit uh, boring. But here is Geekbench 4. Again, look at that monster score here for multi-core score. And even the single score one is respectable. The same for Geekbench 5 here too. Almost 1,200 points. That's not actually bad, especially for an AMD. And then this, very, very good score here. 
pass mark, okay? So again, hit pause if you wanna see all of those different scores there. So very, very good. Strong performance, especially from the CPU. It's an absolute monster. Getting on now to some synthetic 3D mark benchmarks here. So Fire Strike, very good score. The graphic score there, you can see it is 16,000. Now the physics score here, 22,000. I did a little bit of an overclock as well, just to see the difference. Now you don't have to do this, of course, but I like to just squeeze a little bit more out of my laptops. You can add about 50 to the clock. It doesn't really matter too much and about a gigabyte to the memory. So that's the stock score. What happens with that overclock? By the way, this overclock on the memory seems a lot, but it's actually stable. No artifacts whatsoever. I've been testing now for days, no problems. So it gives us quite an increase there. You can see we've gone from 17,000, sorry, 16 to 17 now. Physics score has dropped a little bit and that makes sense because we're now a couple of degrees more on the GPU side of things. And because the thermal transfer pipes are connected to the CPU and the GPU, it does affect the CPU score a little bit. So if you're really into gaming performance and that's what you want, then run it in the enthusiast mode at 54 watts and that will then allow the GPU just to use a little bit and have a little bit more thermal headroom and you can overclock it a bit, just get maximum gaming performance. And here we have Time Spy as well. So that's the stock score. Again, hit pause if you wanna see this. And here we have my overclock. And I could actually go probably a little bit more on that overclock, but I don't really think it's necessary and it's not really adding too much. Let's have a look at battery life now because it's very important. Still, even though it's a gaming laptop, I think a lot of people would be using this one on its battery considering it's only two kilos and it's relatively slim. So running YouTube just nonstop with the RTX 2060, just streaming constantly. I got two hours and 37 minutes. I thought that was all right for a 62 watt hour battery. Now, if you game nonstop, I tested the Witcher 3. This one uses both the GPU and CPU quite a lot. And that is probably why I only got 62 minutes, which is not really an amazing kind of result. And here we have light work. This is not bad for a gaming laptop. If you're just using Docs, Spreadsheet, Chrome, and Edge, for example, you can expect over five hours. I managed to get five hours and nine minutes before it completely powered itself off. Now this laptop has the two downwards firing speakers and they don't actually sound that bad at all. Here's a sample of them at 100% volume. So I will be using this particular laptop here for video editing, 4K video editing, and the timeline even set to the preview here to full, that's the full 4K with Adobe Premiere Pro 2020, latest version here by the way, it is fast. I'm not seeing any lag or anything like that, can move around in the timeline, I can adjust things, and of course apply your different filters and settings and warp stabilizer and all sorts of things, very quick, as you'd expect for this kind of spec of laptop. So what about the actual export times here. So I'm gonna do the typical test I do, which is one minute of footage. And it will be this right here, the YouTube 4K preset. And we'll set the slider here to about a minute of footage. And then I will hit the export here. So that's a minute, more or less, okay? And here's the timer. So start and export right here. This should only be about 22 seconds or so. That is with the fastest Intels. And it's looking very promising. So the mini PC with the Intel, it had the 9750H and the GTX 1650 did it in 22 seconds. But it also uses the Intel's integrated graphics. And here we go, 25. You could say 24 seconds for my delay to hit the export button. So 24 seconds, not bad. You can see here, that that was the RTX 2060 and the CPU that was doing most of the work there. Here's an example now with the Witcher 3 of using the overboost mode. So right now this is just the balance, the normal mode, and you can see we're clock rates on the GPU about 1500, right? And now I'm gonna push the overboost, see what happens here. It's suddenly gonna go up by about 150 to 200 megahertz on the GPU core clocks. And this really does actually give us a nice boost in frames per second. So I will actually toggle it off again and you will see the difference here. So once I push the button again, see we drop down and lose about maybe five or six frames per second, which may not seem a lot, but it's a nice little additional 
boost here that we are getting. And what kind of performance can you expect from this? So we'll show you a few games. The Witcher 3 here that I'm currently testing, you get an average frame rate of 83 frames per second on that high setting. This is not overclocking the GPU, but this is using that overboost mode. Far Cry 5 now using the inbuilt benchmark. What I did is of course run 1080p, everything will be 1080p, but just using the balanced mode, you get an average of 89 frames per second, which is very good performance here. Now, if you do use that overboost mode, that then gives us an average of 91. So not really worth it with this particular game here for the extra heat and fan noise. I also did test out the ultra preset and again, another respectable frame rate here, 85 on average. I did overclock the GPU a little bit with this one too. Shadow of the Tomb Raider, so this is 1080p again, and I used the high setting preset. I did the in-game benchmark, and you get an average of 87 frames per second. And then I did decide, okay, I'm gonna use the overboost now, so that will let that RTX 2060 then use, of course, up to 210 watts, and we get an average of 90 frames per second then. And what about if we did overclock the GPU a little bit? So 50 megahertz more on the core, 1,000 more on the RAM, that gives us a result then of 93 frames per second. And I finally did test it out with the RTX DLSS enabled. And that was very respectable, 90 frames per second here. So again, really good performance from an RTX 2060. Of course, no review would be complete without Call of Duty Modern Warfare. This is Battle Royale mode on the high setting. You get an average frame rate of 86 frames per second, so it is super playable. It does dip down at times to 64, but that's not a problem. It's not too choppy. And if you want just the absolute best performance, still 1080p, then of course I did test out the settings lowered down onto the lower settings here. You get an average of about 100 frames per second, and the 1% low frame rate was 86 then, which is much better. Now, if you want to get 144 frames per second, I don't actually think it's possible with this title unless you load it to, say, 720p, which you don't want to do. Wolfenstein, the new Colossus. This one, of course, it does support Vulcan. I wish there were more Vulcan games out there, and you'll see why, because this gets an average frame rate on the Uber setting, 152 frames per second, which is very good. And okay, the 1% low frame rate, well, it's still over 100 frames per second, 116, which is excellent. Counter-Strike Global Offensive, so this one here on the maximum highest settings, it doesn't run constantly at 144 frames per second, sadly. So you do need to lower the settings down just to like high, then you'll get that steady 144 frames per second, matching the 144 hertz refresh rate. So perfect for competitive games, just these lighter, older titles. Okay, one of the more important things, of course, is thermal. So how hot does it get? Well, it reaches almost 97 degrees. This is when I was pushing both the GPU and CPU very, very hard. So right now, I've actually got a stress test going on in the background, which is the GPU and the CPU, and it will level out at about 85 to 86 degrees, which isn't too bad. But let's now have a look at those surface temperatures. So this is where it did get quite hot, right in the middle of the keyboard. So not where the WASD keys are, they're not too hot. It's just in the middle here. It will reach almost 52 degrees Celsius. Ambient temperatures are 25 degrees. The palm rest is cool and the trackpad as well is cool here. Now this was on the overboost mode or on the enthusiast mode, it will reach these temperatures. So I'm stress testing the laptop with the different profiles here now. So this is the performance mode with the balanced fan. What you can expect is about 46 decibels. Here's what it sounds like. This is now the enthusiast mode and we have 49 decibels. Overboost mode, it's the same 49 decibels, but if I click the 100% fan, that then brings it up to 54 decibels. Here's a sample, 100% fan. So overall gaming performance, every single title out there and even new and up and coming ones will be playable on the highest setting 1080p, I believe, and even ultra some games. Now, if you wanna push, of course, the 144 frames per second, you want that, constantly then lower settings down. I didn't show too much of that, but 
For older titles or your competitive games, you really do want that 144 hertz. Of course, run lower settings there. And for every single game out there, it's gonna be really, really good performance-wise for that. So does it warrant paying the extra versus say the local models you can probably pick up, the, the uh, Zeus, the MSIs, and other ones out there, HP Omen and things like that? I haven't tested any of those yet, and yes, you are paying a premium for the extra performance you do get with this particular model. So yes, there's probably gonna be people, people in the comments say, hey, I've got the Zeus, blah, blah, blah. Yes, and you've probably got your CPU set at 45 watts. So this is really for those that just demand that extra kind of performance you can get out of this because at the 72 watts, you can see from some of those CPU scores with synthetic benchmarks, for example, that it is very, very good. Really high performance out of this and some just kind of crazy high scores for a laptop having those eight cores, the 16 threads. It's a phenomenal APU. The Ryzen 7 4800H, I'm a huge fan of this particular one, this model here, and really Intel's gonna have to step up and, and they will be. And the way they have kind of, uh, you've seen the news that you know with their 10 nanometers they're pushing ahead, seven nanometer for them is still a big issue. Now it is sad that, that this is the best GPU we're gonna be able to get for now with this particular configuration with that AMD chip there. So the RTX the 2060, with the six gigabytes of RAM, you could say isn't so future-proof as the, say, 2070 Super or something, or the Max Q or Max P versions, but this is a little bit cheaper, and for most people, like, like I said before with the gaming, I think it's gonna be more than adequate. So when you run the overboost mode, you can get those extra clocks out of the GPU. You see the difference, as I pointed out, it will go from, say, 1500 or 1400 megahertz, the clock, on the GPU right up then to say 1750 or 1800. So it definitely does make a difference giving us an additional maybe five to 10% performance boost versus say the 90 watt models here. That's just an approximate, okay? But it does boost the performance. However, the cons of this laptop here. So I talked a little bit about the price that yes, it's more expensive versus other models, but you get the performance benefit with this one uh, with those power boost modes but then it does generate a lot of heat around here. This is a quite a hot laptop. Considering the other laptops out there will be running only 45 watts on their CPU, the cooling on this does do an excellent job. Very, very good. But it will reach here about 70, sorry, not 70, that will be far too hot, about 52 degrees, okay? So 52 degrees on the middle here. It's getting toasty to the touch, hot to the touch and a little bit uncomfortable. Now, of course, you don't have to run those higher power modes. You can run just the balance mode. You are losing about 10% performance, but you don't have that really loud fan noise. So running the fans at 100% or close to once you game for a couple of hours on the overboost, you're looking at around 52 decibels or so of fan noise. So that is loud. You want a headset on to have that not bother you. But again, use the balance mode, you can get a bit more on the enthusiast mode, less fan noise and still have relatively good performance. The webcam location, absolutely terrible, looking up your nose, your neck area, and it's, it's bad, bad quality. HD only and terrible. So you really want to use an external webcam with this particular model. And then the other minor thing, some people may see it as not minor, Maybe you like your tech to be looking pristine. I only had this for a few hours and it already looked like it was months old. I'm not joking because of how hard this chassis is, the materials used, the alloy on the palm rest and on the lid is just an absolute smudge smear magnet with the matte black coating. And overall the build quality I think for the price is okay, but it certainly doesn't feel like one of the top end premium laptops. But Overall, I am very pleased with the performance of this, the screen, and overall as a package, I think, well done. Uh, Tong Fang and of course, XMG, they've done a really good job with this particular model here. And I bought this unit myself, but I hope that in the future, I will be able to get a few loan units from XMG to continue to review gaming laptops, maybe get myself a little bit of a base there on the frames per second and performance of each different laptop and to be able to compare them a little better than just single one off kind of videos. So thank you so much for watching this review. I hope you did like it and I hope to see you back in the channel with more up and coming laptop reviews, mobile phones, tablets, all sorts of things.